male child is more frequently diagnosed with a cancer diagnosis as compared to the girl child. So psycho oncology is a, is a subspecialty that is so important. You can work effectively in an oncology space without empathy and compassion for your patient. Welcome everyone to a new edition of the Beyond the Cancer Diagnosis interview series. Uh, today, I have the pleasure to present you Foluke Saramie. Uh, she's a radiation and uh, clinical uh, oncologist in Nigeria. Hello, Foluke. Uh, thank you for joining us. Hello, Andre, and thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm delighted. Thank and, you so much. Uh, thank you. Uh, the topic of today's discussions would be um, with focus to pediatric oncology, but uh, uh, more precise with the challenges and psychosocial dimensions of what pediatric oncology looks like today in low middle, middle income countries with focus on Nigeria. Uh, dear Foluke, to begin our interview, um, I would like to, to explain or to develop for, for our audience how we see the concept of pediatric oncology in Nigeria. And here I'm uh, interested in, let's say, uh, the, the age of the patients, the average age of cancer diagnosis, uh, access to healthcare. So how, how it looks, this topic in, uh, in Nigeria nowadays? Okay, um, pediatric oncology services and uh, practice in Nigeria is still um, being developed. You know, um, studies have shown that there's an estimated 200,000 um, diagnosis of um, childhood cancer in low and income countries with um, just um, 20% survival rates as compared to 80% in other, um, in other plans. And the prevalence of this will keep rising particularly or do not limited to maybe the associated urban, um, rural urban drift. Um, in Nigeria, uh, we, our practice is still being developed and um, oh, there's so much that needs to be done. The cancer, the population-based cancer registry in Nigeria, which is good, but not at its, hot, uh, at its best, um, is where we still get statistics from for um, incidents and prevalence. So some studies, some, some pockets of studies that have been done, and it shows that um, the, the statistics varies depending on the type of cancer. What I mean by that is that leukemia, not Hodgkin's lymphoma, Hodgkin's lymphoma, bone and soft term, tissue sarcomas, but basically an average of 4.7 years um, patients and children present with cancer in Nigeria. And then we have them um, for six years for hematological cancers like leukemia, von Hodgkin's lymphoma, Hodgkin's lymphoma, for soft um, tissue um, um, diseases, um, so cancers could go like 11 years or 12 years. And um, another important thing to note is also the association between um, childhood cancers in Nigeria and the infectious diseases. I'm particularly talking about the malaria cancer control. You know, preliminary studies have shown that um, there's an association of um, of um, childhood cancers with um, um, Epstein Barr viral diseases and also Plasmodium falciparum, um, which is the causative agent for malaria. So that also could also be a, a, a reason why we have the incidence of the Bacillus lymphoma much more um, in Nigeria. And concerning the male to female um, ratio. Boys, the male child is more frequently diagnosed with a cancer diagnosis as compared to the girl child. So basically that's um, in terms of our statistics in the country. Um, you mentioned uh, also the um, opportunities, let's say, working with an association, but uh, what are the biggest challenges you have to face as a specialist in providing uh, care to a child or uh, to his parents or her parents <laughs> yes. in, in this context, which is that easy? The, the, yes, um, pediatric oncology cancers, I mean, generally um, in terms of um, cancers in Nigeria, we face the challenges we have are multifactorial. Multifactorial, and I want to talk about it, um, we are trying to categorize it into two aspects in terms of institution and then also um, late presentations. Now for the institution, uh, we, we have um, 
we don't have adequate trained staffs trained um, specialists in the country. We have about 200 million um, people and um, population in the country, and yet the numbers of pediatric oncologists are so few. I think just about 10 to 12, I'm not sure, pediatric oncologists in the country. So that problem is then for, for, for our patients, it's late presentations. And the reason why there's late presentations is multifactorial. One, the referral system is not adequate. There's a low index of suspicion for cancer, for pediatric cancers. So before the, the patients and their family caregivers present to the hospital, they would have gone through all kinds of um, you know, poor referral system before they present. Another issue that we face that I see is also financial toxicity. Our um, health insurance scheme is not adequate, though the government has tried to put some platforms to make it easier. Like what we have, um, we have um, the Cancer Health Fund now, which has been introduced in Nigeria, where patients are credited, you know, from from the from the federal government to help them ease that. But it's still not enough. Most of them, um, the cancer um, um, platforms that 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 people provide, um, well, I say relief for is mostly for adult cancers. Pediatric cancers is just coming into for you. Have to, we have to fight for recognition. We have to fight for opportunities. We have to tell them the importance of um, pediatric cancer um, in the country. So most um, attention goes to breast cancer, cervical cancer, you know, colorectal cancers. So pediatric cancer now is just coming to the forefront. Even this um, cancer health fund that um, has been provided by the government was initially provided for adult cancers. It's just in the last two years that opportunities have been given to pediatric cancer um, to be part of that um, health fund. So we have that issue. Then we also have the cultural and the um, religious beliefs in our country, where people prefer to um, we'll go to traditional medicine, alternative medicine, to deal with things like that, because that's just metastasis when they see a child or, or when they see a child with a swollen you know, tummy, they go like maybe there's something going on, black magic and all that. So our religion and our cultural beliefs is also a big hindrance while um, we see um, late presentations in our country. So this these are big issues um financial toxicity late presentations a poor referral system and inadequate training of them pediatric oncologists availability of pediatric oncologists in the country is a huge issue that we see um you mentioned uh, this uh, let's say inequalities in cancer care access which is a, a nowadays topic within oncology within say, oncology it is a, a, an important subject nowadays for everyone to have the equal access to cancer care. But as you mentioned, you have to face the system. And uh, then you, uh, you mentioned also about spirituality. And here I want to ask you, um, what uh, from your experience and uh, as working with patients, um, what is the level, let's say, of stigma in cancer care, especially of self self stigma? They are thinking like, "I'm, it's my fault that I have cancer," or uh, "It's somebody else's fault that I have cancer." So, uh, and how? Uh, what are the barriers, psychological yeah. talking, in uh, trying to help them? starting from this self-stigma, which is um, nowadays a very a, a frequent problem to, to oncological yeah. patients. This is the first thought. It is my fault. Uh, maybe yeah. if I did this, I wish I couldn't do this. So mm -hmm. how, what are the bar barriers that you have to face? face? So sincerely, it's a huge barrier in our setting. Well, the culture and the religious, um, where our culture and religious belief plays a vital role in terms of our well being. And um, so, unfortunately, that cancer diagnosis really comes with a huge you know, amount of um, psychosocial issues. And stigmatization is definitely one of it. And stigmatization, even in terms of self guilt, you know, that what, what did I do? How did I cause this? Or somebody else is the one attacking me. You know, so it's it's a huge barrier and it's it affects our clinical practice because what that results to is that the health seeking behavior is poor. People wouldn't come to receive the fundamental orthodox medicine path, um, wouldn't come through that pathway 
they would tend to go to traditional medicine or alternate medicine. So it's it's worrisome and it's um it does it's 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 eventually if we care is not taken, it's emotionally exhausting as an oncologist when most of the patients we see are presenting late just because of this cultural and religious view that has to do with stigmatization. So what we need to do um, going forward in terms of how can we do this is being done, but we need to do it much more, particularly for pediatric cancers now. We need to increase awareness and advocacy. We need to amplify this, and not just in urban settings, but also in rural settings where people are not enlightened and they, they can easily believe in the superstitions and all that type. So as um, clinicians, while we are in the hospital setting, we also need to be involved in community outreaches and advocacy, particularly in rural um, in areas. And one of the things that I, I've, I've seen in my practice that people respond to, to is also survivors. If we have a child of survivors who have gone through things and they are now fine, we need to bring them on board too because when they speak, um, the populace will listen better than if just an healthcare professional is the one giving the advocacy to tell them about that child with cancer. If you come on time, the survival rate is good and all those things. So we need to amplify our community outreach, our community advocacy, not just in urban settings, but also in rural settings where we have majority of people who actually believe this cultural and the religious beliefs. So. You, you mentioned the advocacy and all the issues, uh, including financial issues, because as we know, oncology is not a cheap uh, disease. Yeah. And uh, not... yeah, and uh, uh, here uh, it comes the questions uh, about parents. Um, how they uh, deal with the stress of having a child with cancer or does your hospital or other association provide uh, psychological uh, care regarding How we go sleep uh, problems or <laughs> stress and uh... so psych oncology is a, is a subspecialty that is so important in fact in fact i call it the heart and soul of oncology care and I totally believe that if you are taking care of a physical ailment and you don't deal with the mental issues concerning that patient or the family caregivers, will actually won't get the best optimal care or the clinical outcome we so desire. Family caregivers are so important, particularly for parents of children of pediatric cancer patients. They go through a lot of stress. They go through a lot of anxiety. They go through a lot of pain. Will this child leave? You know, particularly when when the children are at the point, maybe a child preparing to write um, exams to go to college, and all of a sudden the child is diagnosed with um, cancer, and all those all those things stops. Sometimes it has to do with some um, financial constraint and all that. So the 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 parents go through a lot. Sometimes the this one of the parents may have to leave work, take excuse for work just to be there to support the child while going through the treatment. So psych oncology um, as it's not really where it should be. It's much better thanks to our uh, president-elect, Dr. Chema, so she really amplifies psych-oncology in Nigeria, but we still do not have psych-oncology units in most institutes. So it's, we just have pockets of clinical um, um, psychologists or psychologists who are just interested, kind of giving services pro bono. But what we need in our country is to have institutionalized psych-oncology units in each institutes or, or hospitals to provide this care for the patient. So majority of the patients, um, of, of, the, of the parents and the family caregivers of this, of this um, children, I'm sorry, they don't get the adequate um, you know, support that they need, psychological support they need, they don't. If they're lucky to be in an institute, um, in an institution where which I work, where psych oncology is well established, um, they get it, but if they're in other institutions, they would not get that. So majority of um, family caregivers and parents for pediatric cancer patients, I, they don't get psycho-oncology social support that they need yet. Uh, but more, it still needs more to be done in that area. Uh, you mentioned uh, psycho-oncology support in every, um, uh, let's say, hospital or healthcare uh, institution. This is a uh, one of the core issues of uh, 
psychology and all the international societies that are dealing with psychology also in Romania we have uh, this uh, on our to-do list at least one psychologist on each uh, uh, oncological hospital but as you mentioned it is very very difficult nowadays the number of cancer patients are increasing the number of specialists are decreasing so uh, we will arrive at the point that we'll have to deal with so many patients that will not face, like physically, to succeed dealing with so many patients. And here comes the issue of education. Uh, yes. how, how is in Nigeria nowadays this prevention and education from... Uh, psycho-oncological point of view with regard to oncology issues? Okay, for, for Nigeria, um, psycho-oncology is still developing, but um, in, in the area in terms of um, education, we have a master's program, master's in psycho-oncology at, the, the, at my department, Department of Education Oncology, um, where we started the master's program and we've had some people um, um, pass through it and they're doing well. But most people would, would can't really sacrifice that one and a half months, I mean, one year, six months um, time. So what we are looking at is that maybe to find a way to make certification, like a six months diploma or a three months diploma so that the, these people can actually see go to various um, hospitals and then practice. We have so many nurses who are interested, but it, but it, 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 the complain about, I can't go, come all the way to the West, you know, maybe some of them are in the northern part of the country and they're interested and they and they, are, they feel that they can't come all the way to the Southwest to get this education. So um, the advocacy and the workshops for psycho-oncology, it's, it's um, growing, but it's not as strong and as established as we really want it to. So we'll be looking for different ways to um, maybe um, create diplomas or certification to reduce the master's program so that more people can come and quickly go back. And then also, there's, we can't really do much also if you don't have um, what I call high profile engagements. It, we, you know, we can have all the ideas, but if you don't have um, strong stakeholders, political will from institutions who agree and see the importance and the benefits of psycho-oncology, we won't go far. So we need our, we need to have high profile, you know, stakeholders engagement with the state government, with the federal government to let them see the importance of psycho-oncology and creating these units in different institutions, teaching institutions in the country. That is the way forward. If not, we just need to pockets sort of you no know, um, advocacy. It wouldn't go around, it's gonna become a national thing. So we also need high profile engagement to see to, to, to make it work. Uh, regarding uh, psychology courses or specializations, this is also another important issue that, uh, for example, International Psychology Society is trying to, to manage it some way, but it's also very difficult because you can't do a curriculum that uh, it goes all over the world. So it, it is also, again, the thing of the national authorities to understand, to develop, to yeah. implement what yeah. we as specialists, we recommend because we just mm -hmm. can recommend something from our yes. expertise, yeah. but we, 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 more we can do because uh, we, we give them the feedback from the ground, working with patients, but yeah. we, we can create programs and uh, diplomas and so on. Uh, I would like now to return a little bit to your specialties as radiation uh, <laughs> oncology. Uh, did you um, meet cases of scansiety, what it's called, working with children, <laughs> making a lot of uh, cities, magnetic, uh, let's say, uh, issues and uh, analysis. Did you meet this uh, concept? And if yes, how you try to manage for, for children? <laughs> Not to understand, but to keep going, doing, which is very important for, for their, their health. It's a crucial issues. 
Yes. So Oscar anxiety really it's it's um it's peculiar more in children, but we also see it in adults too, but people with claustrophobic um claustrophobia that you can't really stay in the closed place, particularly when radiation therapy is ongoing. So we have to deal with that. But for children who are, you know, anxious and then up and about, they're not calm. So we try to we speak we see it all the time. So what we do is that before the treatment, we have what we call them pre-visitors, where we, we take the, ch the children to see the area of treatment, to, to show them pictures about what it is about. We, we inform them, we educate them. And we also use you know, distractive techniques that make it in a playful manner, you know, try to explain in a childlike way, they are going to go into this place and then this is what it's going to be. It's not just going to touch you, but we'll be here looking at you. If you need anything, you can just, you know, do this or do that. And we can hear you all the time, just speak. So the previsit tours of information and guidance helps the children a lot. You explain to them, you make it playful, very playful so that they feel okay. But in cases where for radiotherapy, we still um, use um, sedation, pharmacological interventions, because it's very important that the still during radiation therapy so that we're going exactly to where the tumor is and we're not dealing with them, you know, um, organs at risk. So we, we use um, ketamine in my, in our, in my um, center, uh, which is a mild sedation pharmacological um, agent, just to keep them calm because the treatment we just take about five to 10 minutes and they're done. So we do that at, um, during the actual treatment, but before then we educate them, made them feel comfortable. So yes, we, we see that a lot all the time. <laughs> And uh, seeing this uh, and talk with the children before the, the intervention, uh, yeah. how, how do you feel them? Uh, they trust you, not you personally, but trust the doctors. Uh, they, they trust the, uh, let's say, uh, the, yeah. not a process, but uh, it, it creates an empathy. Do you feel there is an <laughs> empathy between you and uh, the patients? I, oh well, I, I'm a radiation oncologist. I'm also a psych oncologist. So I really understand the importance of clinical empathy. I am a, I'm an advocate for clinical empathic skills that anybody working in the oncology space must have a level of clinical empathic skills. You cannot, you can't, you can't work effectively in an oncology space without empathy and compassion for your patients because that is what they really need besides the physical you know, treatment, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and all those we give them, their mental well-being and psychological well-being, emotional state is so important. So I practice it. And um, so some, some of my colleagues do, some are still, you know, work in progress, but it's a very important skill that you can't, you can't be an effective oncologist if you don't have clinical empathic skills. It is a must. It's a must. Uh, you mentioned also that you are an advocate. Um, I know that uh, also advocacy in uh, in uh, cancer care, it is a relative new field, new domain, uh, mm -hmm. and not always uh, the advocates uh, uh, have the results that they want to have. And uh, what are the the challenges for you as an advocate? Uh, in oncology, except the bureaucratic <laughs> bureaucratic things, <laughs> uh, the patients yeah. understand or the caregivers, because here in fact oncology we are talking more about also about caregivers, and sometimes yes. uh, they are let's say more problematic than the patients. So as an advocate, <laughs> how how difficult is to deal with caregivers? Um, one needs. A lot of um, patients in terms of having to repeat information over and over again. You know, when people already have a mindset sometimes about what cancer diagnosis is, and there are a lot of myths and misconceptions about cancer. I had a, I had a, 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 a patient, a pediatric cancer patient, um, and I was, um, while the child was you know, undergoing treatment, I was speaking with the mom. And during the discussion, before the treatment started, I'd had a you know, proper discussion with them, with her, without so what it is and all that. And yet she was there telling that, oh, that she does, she's isolated the child from the siblings, 
he, she doesn't play, she doesn't allow the child to play with the other siblings. They don't share, sleeps on a different bed. And I'm like, no, that's so wrong. That cancer is not contagious. That was the first thing I explained to you. But, you know, so having patience to, you know, re-educate over and over again and deal with the fixed mindset, is it's, it's, it's one of the barriers because you could repeat information like 10 or 20 times and they might still not get it. So one needs to keep on educating them about this is what can so it's not contagious, it's not fatal. Um, this, you know, so many misconceptions that one needs to keep educating them over and over again. So as an advocate, I, I think we need patience. It's one of the, <laughs> the issues um, to keep re-educating people. And then of course, um, the other issues about advocacy, and we've mentioned that um, in terms of, apart from bureaucracy, the family caregivers is just education, education, having to tell them over and over again until they get it to a level that will not cause harm to um, their children or themselves either too. And um, uh, we don't have uh, much time uh, to, to uh, <laughs> finish in a positive way. Uh, as specialists, we have to, to provide hope. Uh, how uh, how uh, it's hope see uh, in Nigeria? There is hope. You provide hope, but uh, the hope that you provide is received by the patients. They have hope that it will be it will be at the end. Okay. okay? Uh, if truth be told, it's far. It's 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 not. I mean, if I'm if the truth be told, um, it's hard to communicate hope. Um, and I think one of the reasons it's because of the misconception about the fatalism of um of um cancer, the ones um you diagnose with cancer, there's no way out, and then also, and unfortunately, because we have late presentations. So they hear of so many people too who have died from cancer. So telling people, um, providing hope that there'll be a good clinical outcome is a challenge. Do you have caregivers say that, what's happening? Tell me, you know, what was going to happen? And then you often have somebody in denial, they don't want to know. And then um, they'll just keep hoping. So it, it's both ways. We have some who are hopeful, but most times it's difficult giving hope in our, in, in our setting. But we just have to. We just have to. You just have to go further, uh, providing hope and uh, especially provide time because the oncological patients feel that there is no much time left. Yeah. And uh, he he tries to do everything in uh, uh, once uh, all, all at once, so, which is okay. also not good. There is time. There is hope and. This yeah. is uh, our uh, interview conclusion for today. <laughs> to provide so hope, much. to provide time, to provide trust. So, uh, for look at thank you very much for uh, joining thank me you. today for these interesting discussions from from uh, the ground, as I can say, to see the the reality, and which is most important. And uh, from reality to to make it happen it is a long way but as specialists yes. we have to to do our job for yes. the the benefit of the patients thank you. Uh, thank you very much and good luck in your activities further thank you so much henry for having me it's a pleasure to be here thank you and great work you're doing <laughs> great work don't forget to like comment share and subscribe to onka daily on youtube Hit the bell icon to stay updated.